Now 250,000, now I'm to get 275, five, I'm to get 275, three. Now 300,000, now three and a quarter, 325, five, I'm to get three and a quarter, I'm to get 325, now half. Now I'm to get 325. And hello again from Dallas, the center of the world at the intersection of the LBJ Freeway in Dallas and the North Dallas Tollway uh, at Lincoln Center and um, the home of United Real Estate, United Country. Uh, uh, we also have United Country Real Estate that's based out of Kansas City. So we've got a lot of things going on and um, we have a great show today. And I want to talk about, uh, uh, well, the first thing I want to do, I want to introduce our guest. We have Rick Bernstein. He's an award-winning sales consultant and sales trainer, uh, over 20 years of experience in that area of uh, clinical healthcare and healthcare philanthropy. Uh, he, is also, uh, he is also a uh, voice actor uh, he does voice over work, and uh, as of in the last three months, I guess he's a he's an auctioneer, and he attended America's Thanks. Auction Academy here in Dallas, and that's how we met. Uh, good to have you on, Rick. This is our very first remote broadcast, so you're the first one to do this with us. So hopefully everything will go Great. smooth. I remember us being a class of first when uh, we were with you in June of this year, so it's good to be first again. Thanks. You bet. Good to have you. Now, I, I know you're in Virginia uh, and, and Virginia today, uh, but you do a lot of work on the East Coast and Canada and you uh, work a lot of uh, events and things in D.C. Um, why don't you just uh, give us a little overview of what uh, Bernstein Solutions is? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the time to be on your show. Yeah, so so Bernstein Solutions is an organization. It's a small boutique consultancy that I founded in 2019, and it's really designed to creatively um, deepen not-for-profit supporter relationships and increase fundraising. And we do that in about five ways. The first way is drawing on my experience working with not-for-profits uh, as a sales consultant and actually coming up with a strategic vision for the organization. So sitting with them and listening to who their people are, their processes, their technologies and systems, and understanding really how I can um, you know, help them and, and what's the right uh, path to take forward. So first and foremost is that consulting piece. And then the next two are really from what I learned from you in auction school and then beyond through some training and, and conferences and those sorts of things. One is doing live auction, uh, auctioneering. Um, and that is basically at a benefit event or gala, there being an item that is donated or consigned that attendees can bid on. And it's a fun, unique experience that people feel good about. They get to, uh, again, uh, bid on a neat experience, but also know that their donation is um, going towards the mission of the organization. So there's the live auction component, and then there's what they call the fund to need or live appeal. So that's another aspect of what I do the night of the event, um, actually really touching uh, the audience uh, and, and reconnecting them with the mission and why everyone is there celebrating that evening. It's not only to connect and have a good time, but it's also to refocus on the mission of that organization and making a difference. And so we do the live appeal. And then the other two um, are related to the event or lead up as well. Uh, uh, you know, the fourth service being master of ceremony. So sometimes I'm just an MC. So I just get on stage and I help coordinate the show flow and, uh, you know, being kind of somewhat of an ambassador uh, for the organization and to the attendees to make sure everything's running smoothly um, and that uh, and that everyone is, um, you know, engaged and, and having a good time. And then fifth, uh, it's a little detached. It's related to the event, but can be detached ahead of time or totally totally separately, and that's in vo uh, voice narration. So about 10 years ago, I became a um, professional voice actor through, similarly through like auctioneering, going to school, getting trained, um, cutting a, a demo, and then sending that demo out to organizations to be their voice for their brand, their service, their product. And so I do that for for-profit for for organizations as well today, uh, as well as doing it on a, a volunteer basis for institutions like the Smithsonian, you know, narrating their magazines or educational content. So for these organizations under Bernstein Solutions, clients of mine, I will 
help them with anything educationally that they need narrated. Maybe it's for visually impaired or disabled in, in some way, shape or form or just um, doing a testimonial video or trying to emotionally connect, you know, the copy to the listener. So that's kind of somewhat in a nutshell of what we do. Okay. Uh, let's, let's kind of go back. Let's take a giant step backwards because I always like to find out uh, the nuts and bolts behind the person on the microphone. So let's, let's go back to sure. when you were a kid. Where did you grow up? Yeah, so now we're we're going back some decades now. Um, but I uh, I'm a born Washingtonian, so Washingtonian being D.C. capital of the world, uh, was born uh, in Washington, and um, and grew up bounced around a little bit up till about two years old, but spent from that time forward until graduating high school in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is a bedroom community south of Washington, D.C. and just north of Richmond, Virginia. So um, it's a very historic uh, city. I know there's one in Texas, a Fredericksburg, Texas. And um, but it's, uh, it, you know, growing up there, it was still very rural. Um, it wasn't overdeveloped. It's starting to get that way now, just being so close to those two major metropolitan areas. So, um, you know, I, I had a great I had a great upbringing. You know, my my dad commuted to D.C. every day. He worked for the government. My mom was a school teacher. Um, she was a speech teacher. So she worked with um, little ones who had, you know, some form of speech issue that she was trying to help them resolve. Also special education and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, middle class, very happy. Um, we made up our own fun. We go out and be on our bikes all day and come home for dinner kind of thing. Um, certainly no devices to uh, to take up our time for sure. Yep. Um, so you grew up in Fredericksburg, and uh, mm -hmm. and I know that area pretty well. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? I do. Yeah. So I have an older brother. Uh, he's about five years older, and uh, and I say about because our birthdays are just a few weeks apart. Um, but uh, so it rounds up to about five years. But yeah, he's he's up in Philadelphia now. But um, yeah, so we grew up, and it was interesting having a a, a sibling five years older because just as I was getting into a place such as high school, he was just leaving. And so we never really overlapped or had to share or compete, you know, for things. He was kind of over whatever phase I was getting into at the time, but um, very good. We're still very close to this day. I actually just saw him this week. Mm -hmm. So you, um, I'm assuming you went to high school in Fredericksburg. Is that right? I did. I did. So yeah, uh, Stafford, Stafford High School. So there's two neighboring counties of Fredericksburg. There's Stafford County to the north, and then there's Spotsylvania County to the south. So I grew up in kind of the southern part of uh, Stafford County. And so there were two, really two high schools when I was growing up, you know, and when I graduated 20 some odd years ago, um, there was Stafford High School in North Stafford. And, and I went to Stafford. So when you get out of high school, what did you do? Yeah. So, um, you know, actually, it's funny you ask that the summer after I graduated high school, I actually drove cross country with a friend of mine who grew up in Norfolk. He and I had connected and, and became involved through religious type affiliations and youth groups and those sorts of things. And, and somehow we uh, talked our parents into letting us get in a 1992 Nissan Sentra red and drive over 13,000 miles, 32 states over seven weeks and so that summer after high school i we went from norfolk virginia we went you know headed west to about memphis then south to new orleans we cut across texas and came up and ended up in california up to seattle and then clear all the way back so um so yeah so right after high school is when i did that trip and then i enrolled at james madison university where my brother happened to um have just graduated and i uh, spent the next four and a half years um, in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so you you graduate with a, um, a Bachelor of Business Administration in Computer Information Services uh, Systems. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, good question. <laughs> because it's really evolved so much. You know, I, when I was graduating in the late 90s, um, you know, things had just that the the um, internet age had just kind of kicked up and it was really, I mean, it was something, right? You're trying to figure out what's going on. A lot of these startup organizations, um, dot coms is what they called them back then, um, were, were going. And I, I looked at that. I, I actually started college thinking I was going to be a med student and, and following medicine because I always promised my grandma I'd be a doctor. Anyway, that didn't work out. 
but um, I ended up going the um, you know the the computer information system route just because there seemed to be a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity there. So mm -hmm. computer information systems. What I did with that when I graduated was it was actually a very technical role I came out and I was a you know a software what they call software engineer or programmer you know basically uh, developing language that will talk to machines and make things work you know things that we take for granted when we look at our device and just figure it shows up you know there's a lot of work done on the back end of that to make something look easy or, or, or move easy so you know I found out very early on that that was not my life's calling um, and uh, and so I I, I transition and my, my what I will say about my career it's been a career of pivots and of reinventions of myself um, you know I went from that into consulting and working on a government project for the USDA and actually working with the food nutrition services branch of the USDA so I was on site and we were advising them on their systems and computer systems and how they did things in awarding um, money for you know women and children programs and, and child nutrition and those sorts of things. And it was really that experience that I started getting into healthcare and just realizing that just the, the broad expanse of healthcare, how it can just be clean water, it can be food on a table, um, or it can get into these other things like, you know, fighting cancer and, and other things. So um, I, you know, did that for a number of years, did the consulting and then did a full 180 and actually got into clinical healthcare and became a um, a medical device sales representative for um, a surgical company, basically being um, an advisor and a supporter of widgets that actually are used in surgery. And, and so uh, I did that for a long time. And, and that's really what got me really embedded into the healthcare um, kind of industry. Now you're pretty passionate about that from what I can tell. And you also, and, I am, and because of children, you're very, um, you're very interested in the health needs and, and related to children as well. You know, I did. I, th I think I got a little bit of that from from home because you know I see I, g I got a lot of that from home. You know, my dad who would commute, and and he's he's been past a few years, but um he. he you know, he would always make it home to coach my basketball team and to support me and go to my soccer games. And, you know, my mom was a school teacher and she worked with special needs and special ed and in helping them speak and, you know, um, have a normal um, experience. And so, you know, their tending to me as a child was um, very impactful. And now being a dad and having two little ones of my own, one who's almost nine and one who just turned seven, um, I'm very in touch with that and sensitive to that. And um, so, so yeah, it, it, it has been a passion and it's, it's neat to be able to kind of carry that forward professionally, but also personally. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I look at the uh, people that are in our, the auction industry specific because we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. But I think those people that, um, if they do fundraising events, it usually says a lot about their heart because you have to care about people. You have to love being around people and you have to be uh, empathetic and, and in some cases sympathetic, um, but be paying attention to people. You know, I mean, we just did an event last night here in Dallas and, and you know, we're talking about the March of Dimes here. And we, we you know, I had them on the, the show about two weeks ago. And then to see them at the event last night, uh, it was great to see folks that had told their stories. And their stories are very, um, well, they'll tear at your heart. You know, when you start hearing mm -hmm. about premature babies and, and you know, you have one, one child that's um, outgoing and energetic and the other one is kind of out there and not necessarily uh, as wound as tight as the other one. You know, these premature births, they definitely have an impact on the family. It changes a family forever because uh, in one particular case, you know, she was in the hospital for, or these, um, these babies were in the hospital for almost a year before they could even leave. And if you can imagine being a parent and you can't even take your baby home and because they're, they've been in the hospital for 250 days, it's incredible. It's probably the most, probably one of the more depressing things that a man and a woman could possibly go through. Um, and I, I just, you know, I'm still touched by the whole thing just from two weeks ago. And then again, last night in raising funds for March of Dimes. And, and I'm sure you have situations like that when you're doing a fundraising event that, especially in the healthcare side of it, you, you understand it. I mean, you're an intelligent man. So you, you have that, um, with your children, you, you see, you know, you have healthy children 
that function on a daily basis. And when we step back, we get to see everybody else. We get to see the ones that are challenged and are fighting the good fight, but it, it's hard on their finances. It's hard on their lifestyle. You know, they can't go out. They don't have date nights. You know what I mean? Those kinds of things. What's your perspective on all that? Yeah, well, becoming a first time, you know, father, I mean, you, you under, you see firsthand how, you know, literally in the birthing room, you know, how delicate everything is, um, you know, visit not only the physical toll that, you know, my wife is undergoing, but then the child, you know, coming out and then, and then what, you know, how are they going to respond to anything externally and digest and drink and, you know, uh, breastfeeding, does that work? You know, there's so many things to think of. So, you know, just through life experience and having Having a child, I, I definitely, my lens of life just, it changes immediately, you know, once you are then responsible for that child. Um, and we are blessed. Um, and I do not, there's not a day, an hour, a minute of any day that I take that for granted, you know, having two, you know, healthy children. Now we all have our challenges, you know, behaviorally and other things with day-to-day -day how they are but you know something like that where we came out of a delivery room and we were able to go home and then and then you know kind of start our life together um you know part of what brought me to your academy and brought me to the stage um is really to to help others and and, and make that impact and um you know not taking it knowing how precious it is and not, and not taking that for granted you know we um our family, we're, we're very close with friends who have, you know, lost children, um, you know, during, during pregnancy or, uh, again, have gone through a, a lengthy um, uh, stay either through the NICU or, you know, some other, uh, you know, birth challenge. Um, and then also even, you know, now as, as, as little ones, you know, in elementary school having challenges, you know, educationally learning or, or attention and emotionally, socially and those sorts of things. So um, it just, I don't know, for me, it doesn't stop with my own family. I want to try to help and be a conduit to, with others to, you know, um, like you say, have that empathy, connect um, people to emotionally on, on maybe how fortunate their situation is, or if they have a struggle, how we can try to help support them moving forward. Um, so yeah, it, it's something every day, there's some aspect of my life, whether it's personal or professional that, that it engages in that manner. And so, so the causes that I like to, uh, you, you know, really try to help and focus of our, our healthcare causes, but a, a lot of them also are focused on, you know, pediatric type issues and challenges and, and those sorts of things. I'm actually, um, I have an event, um, coming up in February that is um, around, it's uh, an organization that helps fight uh, pediatric brain tumors. And um, it, it's one of those where they, there is no, it, it's pretty much uh, the end of the road for these children. It's just how long can they hold on, you know, yeah. three months, six months, nine months. And what the money goes towards is funding research. It's for prolonging hope. And, and when you are a parent who um, it's out of your hands, you know, it, it just, at that point, there's nothing that was, uh, you can really control other than your own hope and the hope that your child has. And so what this organization does, I immediately was drawn to it. We connected, um, a few months ago and then, um, I'm really excited to do their event, but you know, it's to help fund research to prolong that period. If it's six months, let's try to get them to nine months or 12 months until hopefully there can be some form of a cure or something surgically that can be done to, to help these kids have a life. Sure. Sure. So um, you came to the to the America's Auction Academy in June of this year. Tell me how you made that decision. What what prompted it? And then then how did you pick Dallas, Texas? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where a, a lot of things kind of came together. 19 is kind of our lucky family number. Both of my children have birthdays on the 19th of their month. And, uh, and so 2019, it was interesting. It just, I, I had kind of this um, accumulation of experiences and things that I was doing daily. So, you know, professionally working with healthcare organizations, um, also doing events. So I, you know, being a trained voice actor, I've been, you know, voicing products and services, but also serving as host. I host, um, you know, a few events around town in, in DC. And so, and then I had the not-for-profit experience. And so when 
I'm putting together healthcare and not for profits. And then the, you know, the love of communication and connection through hosting and through other things, you know, I learned about auctioneering really from a close friend of mine who um, who's really been a mentor throughout the process, who also went through your academy and, you know, in connecting with him and, and kind of piecing together what I've kind of had been doing, it just seemed like such a, a match to try to get that um, licensing and certification to actually be able to impact these organizations that I already um, was doing things for, you know, whether it's in a consulting role or actually um, event hosting as kind of an MC. It, it, it was one more kind of uh, thing to have as a part of my, my services and offerings um, that really struck, uh, um, that really struck me in, in, you know, in getting there and spending time in Dallas again, I, um, it, it, it confirmed that that was the right direction. And I've been, you know, um, it's two months after graduating your program, I passed my licensing exam for the state and already started booking events for next year. Good. So I'm, good. I'm, I'm in it. You're in it. Um, so tell me about how you got into doing the, um, the voice actor work. Tell me how that came about. What started that? Yeah, if, there's absolutely a very uh, definitive story around how that came about. I was a newlywed, so um, it's been a little over 10 years, but my wife and I were, you know, newlyweds and I'd sold my place and moved in with her. And um, she, back when people used to actually read newspapers, um, she had a newspaper out and, uh, and in the local section, you know, there was some things about classes and other things. And she, she ran across a class and it's, it was titled very cleverly, get paid to talk and, you know, being in sales hook. and that sort of thing. That's great a hook. great hook. Get paid. Yeah. Who, who doesn't want to get paid to talk? Right. Yeah. So, um, in, in, in seeing that she, you know, it's really full credit to her. She passed that over to me and said, oh, this might be something worth checking out. And so I, I read it and, um, it was very brief, uh, but it went into, you know, how can you use your voice, you know, to earn a paycheck? And so I went to the, um, you know, I went to the class and it was um, downtown and they put a mic just like this one in front of you, in front of me, e each person who attended, there were probably about 20 people there. And um, yeah, and then you recorded a little something, a little copy. And then of course they call you back and say, hey, we think there's potential there. What do you think about our program? Well, I was all in. I, I, I love to communicate. I love to connect with people. So they found the right prospect for sure. Um, and I, I, I fell into it hook, line and sinker. And it's been something again on here almost 10 years later now that, um, I continue to do, um, and, uh, you know, audition and, and, uh, contribute to organizations, you know, a lot of, you know, there's different types of, of voice acting. People think of character voices, right. Or cartoons and animations. Well, yep. there's a whole, I would say the majority of the work that is out there is actually in a narration format where you're yep. educating someone on a product like a, or doing like a, a module of some kind an e-learning module. Um, and so that's the stuff that I kind of like. I kind of like being me, Rick, talking to you, Mike, my friend, and hey, you know what? I just, I tried this new product or this service and man, you got, you, you, you got to hear about this. So more of like a, a guy next door who, who knows what he's talking about and hey, wouldn't that be cool to try? So, you know, I've, I've actually, um, I've landed on some pretty neat um, opportunities and actually being on the radio, being on WTOP here locally for a health system, you know, being a, a someone promoting a, a product and service. And so, and having someone, you know, actually hear it and then send me a note on Facebook saying, I think I just heard you on the radio kind of thing. It's been pretty cool. So what is your, um, what's your long-term plan? What are you, what are you thinking about? Cause you got your hands in a lot of different buckets and I can, I can tell you, as you know, what my schedule looks like. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't have, you know, I don't have a, a two little kids at home. So what, right. what is the, what's the next 10 years look like uh, for Rick Bernstein? Well, fair enough. Fair question. Well, in 10 years, my kids will be approaching, you know, juniors and seniors in high school. So uh, I'll be preparing be to be game. an empty nester. You'll, you'll be at the ball games. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My wife and I have to look at each other and figure out what we're going to do with each other now. Um, you know, uh, you know, for fam you know, for me, family first and foremost. So, you know, obviously staying really involved and engaged with their lives and making them, you know, be, you know, very confident, resilient, independent uh, young people. Um, you know, for me professionally, I mean, I, I've 
found my calling when it comes to an industry if we're looking at something you know i know there's you do a lot of real estate and so many other things uh, in your world and for me i mean i eat sleep and breathe healthcare and healthcare is a big beast it's you can you can be on the back side you know stuff administrative that nobody sees or you could be on the front side where you're really pushing a mission and you know pushing the messaging and trying to make a difference and those sorts of things it's such a broad industry and there's so many things there's so much so many complications with it too to try to figure out i'm fascinated with all of it so it will it's it's going to continue to be in the healthcare industry um, and in serving um, clients um, you know clinically but also um, you know messaging connecting networking and trying to help raise money for um, you know for great causes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so <clears throat> now we pretty well know what you're going to do because you've you're not going to be a doctor <laughs> I won't have the MD after my name, but um, they, they may call but, you. But still, you know, they call me Doctor Jones, and uh, and I think they do that uh, from an educational standpoint. I get that all the time. So <laughs> you, you may be Doctor Bernstein. This could be something special. We may be, we may we may have figured it out. Right, right. And if I'm not one, maybe I play one on TV or something. But hey, um, I tell yeah, people that yeah, all absolutely. the time too. Yeah, <laughs> I stayed at Holiday Inn last night. Um, <laughs> Tell me a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, one is when you came to auction school, what was your perception before you got there and, and what surprised you the most about it? Well, it's funny because, I, I you know, once you get into something and, and you treat it with the respect of it being a profession, you kind of you forget kind of what you initially thought of it, because now you see it with such big eyes as far as being a profession and something that really makes an impact. So the way that I understand and remember what I thought of auctioneering is when I tell everyone now I do this and it's immediately goes to the chant and to, you know, those types of things with auctioneering, talking fast and, um, you know, different types of, you know, whether it's automobiles or antiques or art or those sorts of things. But, you know, what was interesting is that no one thinks about it. The, um, in kind of the way how I am using it moving forward and how so many do that I've learned and met and networked through once coming through the program is people doing this full time for good, for benefits and for galas and for not-for-profit organizations. I mean, it's absolutely its, its own kind of niche. And so, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I've kind of, I've lost... Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so into it now and I've, I, my world has been opened up to so many great people, so many giving people on tips and tricks and best practices on how to help your clients raise more money. And, you know, I've networked a ton and, and really dove so far into it that, you know, I, I almost kind of forgot what I thought going into it. But to me, I looked at it as a, a new challenge, you know. I really haven't spent much time in Dallas other than, you know, the airport in and out kind of thing. So it was an opportunity to just sit in a room with 40 other strangers, um, learn about what they do. You know, people who are, you know, working on a farm and doing real estate and, you know, doing so many other things professionally and looking at auctioneering as something that is a great complement to what they do professionally. So I love, I mean, I've been in sales a long time. I love networking. I love connecting with new people. So I really enjoyed visiting with a lot of folks um, in person there, you know, after class, before class. Um, I've kept in touch with a few people too. And um, so, yeah, I just looked at it as, as, a, as a, a journey, I mean, professionally, but also uh, professionally, but also, you know, personally just meeting some new friends and just some people doing some cool things. Sure. Yeah. We, we certainly get a mixed bag of professions and, and what people do. And it's, it's the one type of class and I'm sure there's others like it, but it is a, um, it's a unique business. Uh, the industry as a whole, you literally can have someone that worked for the FDIC and, uh, um, be in the middle of banking decide you know what i think i'm tired of being a banker and i i want to become an auctioneer and they decide to become, become an auctioneer and then the guy sitting next to him driving a truck for the for a living <laughs> and i mean it's very different um it's very i think it's even hard to explain to some people I, i'm having a hard time explaining it myself it's just the diversity i find very amazing uh, you can have someone that, that came to auction school that really didn't care anything about doing the chant, had no interest whatsoever, and would sit there and tell you, I'm never going to do the chant. And by the time we get through, they want to do the chant. And uh, I think that's, that's a testimony to 
the instructors that we have and uh, the what we can do in in eight or nine days is pretty phenomenal if you think about it it is i mean obviously we covered a lot in that time uh, period and and i know a lot of that is based on what is required as far as education and you know to have to then go to the next step and those sorts of things so you got to fit in as much as you can in that time frame but you know com com coming back to the you know what is auctioneering and you know t to me it's it's really just an extension of you know if you enjoy connecting you know and then you enjoy um actually you know we all are say you know people don't think of themselves as you know salesmen of any kind but every day you're having to do something you're having to sell yourself either at work or you're having to sell something you know to get a commission check or i have to sell my son on drinking water was, you know so he stays hydrated or try to sell right? your kids absolutely <laughs> well and so every day we're we're, we're we're selling but we're connecting and if anything you know and I, I tell people even now professionally even if it's nothing to do with the auctioneering piece if i'm just consulting with the client on on something you know why not go to auctioneering school and just learn how to connect how, how to learn you know um how to uh, just kind of come out of your comfort zone because I know there were some in my class probably that didn't feel as comfortable as I I crave a microphone I crave being in front of a crowd so I for me it just felt very seamless but you know, I almost look at it as something that people to develop themselves, even if sales isn't their profession or being in front of a crowd um, spooks them a little bit, you know, to, to, to just see what it is, because it's a great enterprise and it, it's something it's whatever you make of it. And, um, you know, I chose to use this um, at, at this angle of the profession in a way to try to help make a difference for fundraising organizations. But you can do so many other things with it. Um, and so I, it was a real eye opener for me and, and something that I talked to people about very proudly and, um, and, and, you know, almost try to get them thinking that way. If, okay, you won't actually go to the school and get the official training, you know, what about other, what other ways are you trying to kind of hone your craft or, or connect or be more comfortable public speaking, you know, for my yeah. kids, you know, this microphone here, I have a couple of them. I do events. I bring it with me. I announce my son's baseball games. I introduce the players. We play walk-up music. We do all kinds of stuff and I get them on there and I get, we do karaoke, you know, we hook it up on our TV. Public speaking, I think is one of these um, overlooked skill sets that you, that we, we talk about how you got to learn your reading, writing and arithmetic at a very young age. I think public speaking should be that fourth one. I think that, you know, getting in comfortable in front of a crowd for a presentation uh, to talk to your peers. I think it's really one of those skill sets that will prepare you for life. And um, and so I'm kind of doing that with my kids and I've actually thought about doing some form of program in our community to try to get people, you know, just putting, you know, say whatever you want, right? Give it to them a first grader, a second grader, and just maybe it's they just read a book, but they're in a microphone and they're in front of people, you know, starting to get them comfortable with that. Well, and, and you've heard me say this in school, and I tell people this all the time. I don't look at I don't look at the auctioneer school, uh, America's Auction Academy as a um, um, as an auction school. I look at it as a life school. And I think there's a lot of life that's in that class that has nothing to do with auctioneering. I think we just happen to teach auctioneering. Um, but I think we bring to a, a lot to the table in regard to opening people's minds up, especially about public speaking and uh, how they pr present themselves and, and standing in front of a group. Because most of us, um, almost all of us at some time or another are, are forced to stand in front of a group of people and talk. And I don't think there's anything worse than seeing someone that's so ill prepared that they, they you know, and. It may be of no fault to their own. It's just the fact that they haven't had the opportunities to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, it, there's that that you have. A lot of it comes with um, just life experience and, and be, just be, being comfortable in your own skin, I think, is one of those things that really... Um, it, it takes some work, you know, it doesn't nece necessarily come naturally with somebody to have that self-confidence, but when you know yourself and you feel comfortable with yourself and, and that just comes with time, with practice, you know, you and I have both spent enough time behind a microphone on stage to kind of know and see it maybe played back in videos, pictures, those kinds of things, uh, you know, you need that practice. You need to take pictures and record yourself. I mean, I, I, I'm my biggest critic when it comes to recording an audition, you know, I'll, 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 I'll record it and then, 
edit it and scrap it and then re-record it and edit it and scrap it. I, I mean, I spent so much time to try to get that exact sound or that delivery. And, um, you know, that just comes with practice, just doing it over and over and over again. But it, it really is something that I think um, everyone's going to have to interview for a job at some point in time. And, you know, whether it's around the corner at the local coffee shop or it's, it's on Wall Street, you're going to have to be in front of somebody and sell and know who you are and sell yourself and be comfortable doing that to uh, one person or a panel of people. True. And so, um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a big thing. And, I, and those things that you talk about as far as an auctioneering school, you know, I can't say that I knew going in that that's what I would be coming, getting out and, and those kinds of life types of, of skills you don't think about that you know you think about how it's advertised as something with auctioneering but not um you know really it being an extension of the people business yeah you know for sure you um you and i touched on something before we went on the air we were talking about water and uh, um tell me your thoughts about the value well first off i think we all know that our kids are not eating the greatest food in the world right now if they're going to fast food places if they're going to all the fast i don't care how good you think a fast food place is it's not great food um and sometimes i think uh, a lot of the food that we eat is, is just a semblance of our what we really should be eating you know we, i think we we've, we've learned over the years that you know you need a diet of vegetables you you need those things you've heard it your whole life you always hear this um I hear people say all the time uh, they don't drink enough water and and uh, you and I both know that you need to drink a lot of water because the body is made up of water and for someone to sit there and go I, I've, I've had friends over the years and they go oh I don't drink water and I'm just going like wow um, and they're they're living on a steady diet of diet coke and sweet tea and and all the things that are gonna clog you up and kill you um, <laughs> I guess the soft drinks are all chemicals. That's not even real. And then the sugar that we're intaking, we already get way too much sugar. And so I had to really change my diet a few years ago and, um, and I did it dramatically. Now I can cheat a little bit and enjoy it because I, but I don't have a steady diet of fried. I don't do a steady diet of anything white. I'm not a big, um, mm -hmm. I, I love all that stuff. I love mashed potatoes and baked potatoes and, you know. I used to go to the, you know, when I would go out, you know, I was, we, we didn't have any money when I was a kid. And I'm talking like when in the sixties, we didn't have money. We didn't go out to eat. You didn't go to, out to eat. You, you made food out of whatever you could forage. And, you know, we, we lived on a, a dairy farm for several years and then moved into the city. And even then, you know, if you don't have any money, uh, you got to have a garden. And so we ate what we grew and uh, you can only eat so many tomatoes and so much okra and peas and stuff like that so tell me i want to hear your because you are a health guy and you're the right guy to ask tell me what you think a seven and a nine-year-old kid ought to eat and what should they be drinking yeah well you know it's funny because you become if, if you're not focused on nutrition and yourself and your health um you know, you, you surely become that way when you're an actual parent and actually then, you know, providing that and, you know, um, nourishing, um, you know, other, other people other than yourself, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we, we wash our cars, but we don't always work out. We take care of a lot of external material things, but we're not taking care for ourselves and our bodies and treating that as really, you know, um, what's going to, what's going to really make or break us. So for me, I mean, it, it's a struggle. It's, you know, it's something that we've seen in our children behaviorally that it's, it's markedly different, you know, when they have eaten and, and, and had water and been hydrated versus not. And it would be the same for us too. I mean, how would we feel you and I going all day without a sip of water, right? And their little bodies, I mean, this is, it's kind of a perfect storm when you get in those development formative years where, their bodies are just, they're trying to, they're sponges, they're, they're soaking up so many different stimulus all over, all over the place. And how can they do that at their best if they're not nourished and they don't, and they're not hydrated? And, you know, it's, it, it goes to so many things. I think the first, first thing is access. Like you say, having access, you have, you know, limited means growing up, you only had access to that garden. Okay. So it's, it's interesting how we have access to so many things now with technology and 
overnight shipping, same day shipping. We have, we have the access, but why isn't it getting to people? And that's when it comes to technology can't solve everything, right? Um, it's the process. It's how do you do that? And it's my wife and I making little charts together saying, did you drink? Did you do this? Did you do this? Great. We can have a treat, you know? So it comes back to the process and it's teamwork. It's tough. I mean, I, you know, families, you know, whether married, single, you know, father or, or mother, you know, it's coming up with some process, something that's predictable. Children, what I've learned and speaking for my children is they like like uh, predictability, they like structure, they like knowing, they, they, they feel that sense of comfort and security that they know at this time we're doing this. And it might seem like they're bucking it and not wanting to, um, you know, being very uh, confrontational or, or um, not wanting to kind of fall in line, but they, they do, they crave that, they want to have that predictability. So, you know, we, we do the best we can. I mean, we you know, grocery shop the best we can. My wife happens to be a great cook and we share the same values when it comes to meals and whether it's out or it's at home and trying to keep track of things. Look, you're going to have your milkshakes and your ice creams and your, you know, things that are just kind of thrown together. But we really do, um, we try to get that access. We try to come up with a program to make sure their water bottle is accessible. It's in their backpack. It's, you know, when they come home, they always have water and milk and those kinds of things to drink. So providing that access is, is so important. Um, you know, and it's, it's really at the call. It's at the root of so many things. And, you know, I would say out there too, you know, with your kids, anyone's kids who are showing some kind of challenge behaviorally, socially, emotionally, anything, you know, that's, that's the first place to start because we, we scratched our heads for a long time with ours, you know, on, on, you know, what's going on here? Why, why can't he play well with others and do those kinds of things? We didn't even think to think of hydration and nourishment as being that. Did he skip his snack? Did he not have his water bottle today? And when we started putting those pieces together, we started putting those pieces together. Guess what? You know, it, it we, we saw differences. So, well, now I know what I have to do with my grandson. We're going <laughs> we're, we're to force yeah. feed him vegetables and give him lots and lots of water. Um, yeah, and, give it, yeah, the water makes such a big difference. I, no, they I'm do, and they don't want to drink. And I know. Yeah, I know. know. Yeah, I see it every day. Um, so if somebody wanted to get a hold of you to talk about your business, do you have, do you have a website? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I've, um, you know, b before auctioneering and before kind of this venture of Bernstein Solutions Incorporated again, where we, you know, work with not-for-profit organizations to deepen their supporter relationships and increase their fundraising, um, they can find, you know, those services and what we do at, at BernsteinSolutions.com. Um, and certainly, you know, again, you can reach me directly from um, that site, but you can also find me at thevoiceofdc.com. So The Voice of DC was established once I got into voice acting, and um, it's something where you can see a lot of, uh, of my work. You can hear samples of some of the commercials I've done, some of the reads I've done, and, and some of the events and other kind of hosting MC types of work I've done. So, so both of those uh, are, are, are easy ways to, f to find me and hopefully we can connect and see if I can help you in any way. Sure. And your email is rick at BernsteinSolutions.com. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. That's the easiest way to reach me. Well, you have been our first uh, remote broadcast on the Mike McGavel Jones show. And so uh, <laughs> hopefully the quality is good. Um, nothing's ever perfect the first time. So you may have a couple of minutes where you look like a, one of those um, animated people with your lips moving quick. I don't know. There should be there could be some of that. But uh, Rick Bernstein in uh, Virginia, we're glad to have you on the show today, and we appreciate you joining us and being a part of it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Mike. And just one last little shout out to my World Series champion, Washington Nationals. <laughs> Go Nats. There you go. Well, God bless you. Take care of yourself. I look forward to seeing you again soon. So on behalf okay. of everybody uh, here in Dallas, Texas, with the Mike McGavel Jones Show, Trelvis, our producer, and the folks here in Dallas, we, uh, we appreciate you joining us. See you next time. God bless. And we bid you adieu from Dallas. <laughs>